Okay, now let's move on with the processing of the data. So we have now logged in into the plugin and are now ready to use uh, the actual data set. So what you will do is you can click on the calculator button here, and this will open up uh, a series of options for you to process. So we have two different indicators that we can um, compute with uh, this plugin. Uh, for today, we will only focus on the land degradation indicator but you would also have the chance to uh, use the open change and land consumption indicators uh, if you are interested in a different SCG. So let's go with the land degradation indicator here. And what opens up now is another, another window with even more options. And the uh, processing uh, of the SCG uh, quantification here is divided into two parts. So we have the preparation of sub indicators that are mentioned, that were mentioned in the theoretical presentation already, which is the land cover, productivity, and soil organic carbon. So you can do that all in one step, or you can do it separately. And then in a second step, you would then go ahead and compute the final STG quantifications. So for now, let's uh, use the default UNCCD data and start with the calculation of all three sub-indicators at once. Okay, so the first important part here is to select the time period that is adequate of your uh, interest. That is also within your, your, your knowledge because expert knowledge is actually quite important here. So this means that you in the best case would know what to expect. So if you're interested, okay, you know that between the year 2005 and 2010 significant things happened in your area of interest, then uh, that um, time duration would actually be good to compute. So in our case, we will just uh, take the year 2001 to the year 2015, and we will use the trans.earth land productivity set. Besides the period, we can also uh, choose the land productivity set here. Uh, this can be done by either choosing the trans.earth land productivity set that is available or a UNCCD default data set. For now, we will use the trends.earth dataset, and this is actually um, consisting of three sub-indicators for productivity. So we have the trajectory changes, then we have the state changes and the performance changes, or the performance. And uh, what these three mean is basically uh, the trajectory applies to especially long-term trends, and the state is basically uh, looking more into the recent changes means that they would complement each other. And the performance indicator is basically a measure of how similar pixels are. And that is not being measured over time, but actually over space. So it's a neighborhood uh, relation that has been analyzed. So let's uh, choose the trans.earth land productivity dataset and move on. You click on next. And then we can choose the land cover that we want to use. So as a default, uh, given here is uh, land cover data by ESA, by the European Space Agency, and it's the CCI product um, that is being used here, which is uh, the default data set for UNCCD reporting. So this is quite important. You can say now, uh, I want to change the definition of what my classes are. So you can see here that we have um, seven classes in total. And um, this is actually um, quite, quite important because for different ecosystems, you could have different class definitions. So this should be done with expert knowledge and you should uh, use your expert knowledge to really uh, think about what your classes mean and how they are defined. So you can also see that we only have seven classes. Uh, the ESA CCI product comes with 36 classes, but they were aggregated to only seven of those. Uh, in order to make the analysis and the interpretation a bit easier and also to be um, yeah, guided by UNCCD requirements. So if you make changes here, you can easily go ahead and save your definition and just load it uh, later if you want to use it again. For now, we will just click Save because we didn't uh, change anything and move on to the next window. And this next window, you have the option to edit the transitions between different land cover and what that actually means in terms of land degradation. Now this is very important because in different ecosystems, different environments, uh, transitions between different land cover classes can mean substantially different things. 
So what we have here is basically the default as given uh, by the plugin. Um, what it basically means is that, for example, uh, in the baseline year, which in our case would be 2001, you have a tree covered pixel. And then in your target year, it is transformed into something artificial, for example. This would be this would mean that we have a degraded land. Okay. One example for this would be we have a forest that is being cut down. And instead of that, we have an urban, urban space, for example, or a road, you know, or a parking lot, whatever. So this is one example. Zero in this case means that the land cover was stable, that there's no degradation and that there's no improvement in terms of uh, um, land degradation neutrality. A plus would mean we have an improvement and a, a minus would mean that we have a degradation occurring because of the transition between different land cover classes. So I told you earlier that this is very dependent on your ecosystem or your area of interest. So one good example where actually, for example, uh, this would be different would be in the savanna environment, uh, South Africa, which will be uh, a focus of this tutorial. Uh, we have um, multiple alien species. We have uh, woody plants, a woody encroachment, and that can actually be a problem. Uh, but woody cover, again, is in, in this classification, is part of the tree covered um, class. And in South Africa, a conversion from a tree covered area to a grassland would actually mean that we have an improvement in terms of land degradation. Because in, uh, invasive species are part of land degradation, uh, especially in these uh, dry savanna ecosystems. So what you would actually do here is change this minus to a plus sign, because this would actually mean in your specific case that you have an improvement. So this is something you have to put a lot of time into so that your land degradation uh, change index also makes sense. Um, another, another concern you could think about is the conversion between um, cropland and grassland, because um, it can mean uh, if, you, if you convert a grassland to a cropland that you would improve the health situation in your area because you have more food available. So food availability is, is, is an important part also of the SEGs. But again, if you would convert a grassland to a cropland, uh, you would also uh, gain biodiversity. So uh, it's really weighing up biodiversity loss against a possible loss of, of food. So this is something that has to be defined for your specific purpose. So once you're ready, uh, once you are uh, happy with your, with your table, you can again save it and then move on. So now we have the area window. Uh, in this window, you can easily just um, pick your area of interest. Uh, in our case, we will use the free state of South Africa. So you can here find any, any country you're interested in. And then you can just select a state if you want that. You can also pick the entire uh, country. Uh, if you want, you can also um, uh, upload your, your own area of interest. So it will not be done on, an, on the boundaries of countries or states, but only on the extent of your AOI. So once you, you're happy with that, you can just click Next again. And in the final window here, under Options, you can define a task name. Uh, we will just uh, call this land degradation free state. And if you want, you can also add some notes here, uh, for example, picking uh, notes about um, the kind of definitions you used or maybe a file you've uploaded. So but we will have, uh, leave this blank, but you can use this if you want, uh, ex especially if you have multiple tasks and later on you have to do, have to look them through just to find the right one. Okay, and once we have done this, we can click Calculate. And you can see here that it contacts Google Earth Engine right away. And your, uh, your task is basically just forwarded uh, to Google Earth Engine. So if you want to see uh, how the status is of our task, we can just click on uh, Google Earth Engine Tasks here and hit Refresh List. And then we can just see, okay, it's still running. Uh, when we started and uh, when it will, you know, presumably uh, end 
but this is being refreshed once it is finished. Okay, and now we just have to wait until Google Earth Engine has processed the data. Okay, now after a couple of minutes, uh, it will probably take like 10 to 15 minutes, uh, the data was processed and we can now look at the data. So again, if you click uh, on this uh, cloud symbol, you can just uh, take a look at your task and you will see that it is finished. So if it is finished, you can just click on download results and you will prompt it to your local computer to download the actual data. So the data is stored as a JSON file and you can just create a new folder for that. So we're just gonna call that LD free state. And in this folder, you can save your results. So if you save them, they are promptly uh, also uh, imported into uh, QGIS. So they are already visualized here. And now to just get a better, better picture and to be able to interpret it a bit better, we can also implement a base map that is also part of this, of this plugin. So you can just select the visualization tool and here you can uh, select the base map. And as a mask, in this case, we will also go to South Africa and select the free state. So this will uh, import um, the national boundaries, the state boundaries, uh, as well as some shapefiles that are useful for just knowing where you are. Okay, so just gonna deactivate all of the maps so that we can just have a look at them bit by bit. So we'll start with the trajectory. Um, this is in this data set here. So you can see that uh, there have been quite some changes in the, in the uh, time duration from 2001 to 2015. And uh, we can see that there are some hotspots, uh, especially in uh, urban areas, for example, uh, around uh, Bloemfontein. So again, remember the trajectory is a long-term trend. So that means that we have, um, yeah, quite a number of changes and also uh, we, we have uh, these areas which are possibly uh, changed because of um, uh, woody cover and alien species um, encroachment. So there could be numerous reasons, but you could now go into these areas and have a look uh, at, at a higher, higher detail. Uh, we also have some greening here, means that uh, in the long term uh, it has improved. So it's quite, quite diverse. But basically, across every bigger um, settlements, you can see these negative, negative trends. So now let's take a look at the next data set, which is the productivity performance. So again, me, uh, keep in mind that uh, here less productivity means that uh, a certain pixel has less productivity than a similar pixel. So it's not a, not really over time, but compared to its neighborhood. If we look at the Bloemfontein area, we have some negative trends and also um, in the southeastern, sorry, the southwestern part of our um, area of interest, we can see uh, negative uh, trends. You can see this is uh, marked as degradation right here. And if we would, would uh, look a bit closer here, for example, uh, these, these pixels here are actually part of a, of a salt pan. So if we look at this in Google Earth, for example, um, let me just bring that up. Um, then we could find these, these uh, basically salt pans or these, these very bright areas, which are considerably, con considerably different than uh, what we have in the surroundings. And this is basically what the performance uh, indicator measures as well. So you can also see that there's uh, no data here, which means that there was water uh, at some point. Now let's look at the next data set, which is the productivity state degradation data set. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. The state degradation, um, as I mentioned earlier, describes more of the short-term changes. Um, it's uh, NDVI driven mainly, and um, it is recommended to uh, possibly use smaller timeframes than for example, 10 to 15 years, because obviously short-term changes 
happen over shorter terms and uh, over these longer terms uh, other parameters might be more more important here but uh, you can see that there are some 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 greening effect at least but uh, overall we have in the not in the entire free state but in large portions of the free state um, signs of degradation occurring also over shorter time periods then we have the land cover degradation um, um, map um, that again is based on the uh, transition matrix that we defined earlier so this is really where you see how you defined your table and how you defined your matrix and uh, this is really what you're looking at now so what we can see uh, at a first glance again are urban areas so you can see that around Bloemfontein and also uh, here in the on the border to Lesotho we have um, settlements growing uh, quite quite fast uh, in the in the time frame we are looking at and we have some greening or some positive effects here in the north of, of the free state and the last data set we're looking at here is the soil organic carbon degradation data set so the soil organic carbon data set that is being used uh, by trends.earth is a global data set uh, it's based uh, on a 250 meter pixel uh, basis uh, it's called soil grid and what it basically does is it looks at the carbon stock of the top 30 centimeters of your soil and this data is basically used to quantify the changes in soil organic carbon um, quantities again urban urban changes are obviously degrading uh, the soil organic carbon in the ground because the ground is basically gone um, and um, this again heavily depends on your on your definitions that you um, made made earlier. So here you can define your hotspots basically, and what you would do afterwards is just go into this hotspot and take a closer look, possibly at your at your time series data, your remote sensing data, possibly from from the sentinels, and and from this point what you could do is basically locate your hotspots and then have a closer look inside your hotspots using other remote sensing data sets such as time series data by the sentinels and with this we finished the first part of the processing of data and uh, now we have calculated the sub indicators which are now in the next step being used to calculate the final stg quantification